There are moments in every person's life when they face intense adversity. They're crucibles that forge who they become as individuals and as leaders. Now more than ever, we need leaders who are called to a higher standard, focused on leaving it better than they found it and paying it forward to the next generations. Now, let's join Fire Chief Randy Brugman as he speaks with leaders from all walks of life, as he explores and learns from their personal journeys and the crucibles that have forged them into better leaders and better people. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Crucible podcast. Last week, we heard an incredible story from Pat Kenny, the author of Taking the Cape Off. If you haven't listened to our last episode yet, go and do that now and come back to this one. This week, we're going to talk about some very powerful leadership lessons that Pat learned along the way. Well, thanks for sharing that, Pat. And here's, and, and we'll feature this uh, throughout, but uh, this is a great book. I've read it twice. And, uh, Thank you. I, you know, I walked away with uh, some insights that I wish I would have had uh, when I was, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, I mean, yeah. I think you have to walk the journey, though, to really understand it. But I think the perspective that you bring uh, is, um, is, is significant. And I think that the correlation between mental health is, is a dis- disease just like any other physical ailment. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I think, I think uh, the way that you portrayed it is you never said anything about what you and Eileen and Sean were going through to anybody. Right. because of the, it was a mental illness. And there's so many people that live under that perspective. And unfortunately, it just is another weight that you carry through that journey. It is. And I think if in, in any leadership position, and we're talking as, as having been fire chiefs, but in any leadership position, you really feel like if people look at you and you have some chink in the armor, it, in your perspective, it's not real reality, but you think there's a chink in the armor because you have a child who's sick with a mental illness that somehow they're going to think less of you. Really what I learned after Sean passed and started to share his journey in my department was it was the opposite reaction was we wish we knew we could have helped you. We could have helped Eileen. We could have helped Brendan and Pat. We might not have been able to help Sean, but we certainly would have supported him, but we didn't know. And so I didn't trust them enough. It was it was eye opening for me about I had an opportunity to change and improve the culture in my own department. And because I thought I was protecting him, I didn't want him to walk in the door and people go, oh, there's the kid who was in the, back in the hospital again. But I also was protecting me because I didn't want them to look at me and go, you can't save your own child. How are you going to save us? But once I started to tell the story, it's like when you when your wife is pregnant and all of a sudden you look around and go, where did all these pregnant women come from? Like it, it, it's on your radar. All of a sudden, when I shared the story, people went, oh, yeah, I, I we have a nephew. Uh, my wife goes through that. My, my dad goes through that. But it was pervasive. And whenever I speak, there's a line usually that waits to share stories with me that sometimes they've never shared with anybody in their life. They're the most personal, painful things. In telling a complete stranger sends the message to me that they're in so much pain, but they don't feel comfortable and it's out there. And it's a small circle that I see. It's a much bigger circle and it's much more likely that you've been up against that challenge as opposed to that you've luck been lucky and that went by you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and it's a, uh, it's, it's a growing ailment in our society. And, and, and part of it, and of course, I'm not an expert, but part of it is I think that we don't talk about it. Right, right. All the studies on PTSD show that if, if you just talk to somebody about the traumatic events you've been through, it doesn't have to be a counselor or psychologist. It can be your significant other. It can be a friend. It can be a coworker. That reduces the chances of something turning into PTSD, just that conversation. It's the way that they evaluated that World War II vets came home and were more whole than Vietnam vets because the World War II vets took weeks to get home and the Vietnam vet was flown and they were home in 24 hours and then supposed to assimilate back into society. So we don't talk about it because we're afraid people will judge. And, And the reaction is quite the opposite. People are usually like, 
yeah, I, I, I think I understand part of what you're going through. Or even if they don't, you've opened the door that somebody knows that can support you if you look like you need help. Because as, as the person trying to get somebody through that mental illness, you need a lot of support too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I mean, your, your path was very difficult and there wasn't a lot of support for you. Correct. And, that, and that's on me. If I, if I had really think it opened it up, if I had gone out on that limb, um, I would have just had people build support underneath that limb instead of knock it down. And I, I didn't get it until after I watched Eileen go through it and I went, yeah, it's the same thing. It just got to portray it the same way. Well, and I think the, the title of the book, Taping the, uh, ca- uh, Taking the Cape Off, is, is, is what you're you know, referencing. It's, you know, we shield ourselves from that, especially when we're fire chiefs, right? Right. We compartmentalize, uh, you know, we've been trained to compartmentalize calls and, you know, everything that we do on a day-to-day basis when we respond to calls. And then we bring that back home. And people do that too, right. just general general population compartmentalized to survive. And but the more we share, uh, the better off we are. Well, and, and for, for the most part, no matter what profession you're in, when you go to hire somebody, you look for genuine caring people. You can train them to do anything, but when it comes to integrity and that they care, that, that those are pretty innate values. And then you expose them to something like mental illness where they watch people suffer and they don't understand it. So it scares them and it's just easier to try and ignore it and hope that it'll go away. And all it does then is cause that vicious circle of nothing ever gets any better. And then in some cases, like in Sean's, it it becomes terminal and they have no choice but to go, I don't want to, I don't want to be here anymore. I just can't take that pain. He was incredibly insightful in we lost our, 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 my mother-in-law made a decision at one point she was ill and said, I don't want any more treatment. And she passed away. And after she did, Sean asked Eileen, why don't I get to do that? And she said, what do you mean? He said, granny decided no more, no more treatment, no more. I just want to die. And everybody said, good for her. Good for her. But I'm making that same statement and people are looking down on me. And again, he's 19 years old at this point, And that was the conversation. Well, Granny lived a long life. And he goes, no, it's the same. And you know what, Randy? He was right. For him, it was the same. And again, n- not one of those until I could process it for years that I go, oh, my God, he was right on the button. It was it just as a parent and as somebody who's wearing that cape, you're going, I'm not giving up. So at some point, that cape's going to work and I'm going to save the day for you. And for me, it just failed. Yeah. So as uh, from a leadership perspective, organizational leadership, uh, whether it's fire service, you, you know, you're running a small company or a big corporation. What, what can what can leaders do to engage in the mental health issue with their employees better? I think one of the first things based on what we see in the insurance industry and everything today and the struggles of putting together packages for employees is when you're doing your orientation for your employees, they need to know all the things that are are there. They can avail themselves to. So you you talk about their insurance, you talk about vacation time, you talk about bonuses, whatever it would be, but very rarely is much emphasis put on. And if you have a mental health challenge, you as an individual worker here, based on the stress of what we do in our organization or based on stress that might be in your family, here's what we provide you. And by the way, here's also what we provide to your family, because our overall goal, we talk about, and we did this in the fire service all the time, but very valuable in, in business. People are moving from business to business because they're looking for values. They're looking to be valued much more, I think, than when You and I came in the fire service. It was like, all right, that's my job. I'll probably be there for 20 years. It doesn't really matter whether they value me or not. I'm there to do something for the public. People who are coming into the environment today are going, that's great. I think they have that too, but they want more value for them and their family. Well, as an organization, you need to tell them, here's what we're giving you. You may never need this. I have a feeling someday you will. 
if you have to put your dad in a nursing home and your dad is your hero and you're going to go through that pain and that feeling of your cape didn't work, you're going to go through that. And here's exactly what we will provide. And we also will provide it for your family. So when you're making a decision about what organization you want to work for, know that we provide that. Then after that, you have to role model it. It can't just be at the orientation or it can't be a poster that gets put up in the, you know, in the lunchroom or whatever. It's got to be, if it's that valuable, then annually we have, we have a training. We have something that we do with the employees. But then you also need to do something for those families. And it's... Sometimes that's a challenge. I get it. I never worked in corporate America. I can't imagine being an executive in some huge organization and what you have to do. But you have to be resourceful. You can't tell me it can't be done. Social media allows you to have that spread outside of the building to so many people. So you have to do things for the family. And I did something really, really simple that I just kind of stumbled on that ended up teaching me how valuable it was to include the family. When I went, I left a career organization that went to a combination department and we had to have a certain amount of drills you had to make in order for you to stay on the roster. So one drill a year would be what I call the significant others drill. And the way it worked was I sent the invitations to the significant others, whether, and they defined who the significant other was, whether it was boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband or wife. And you stayed home with the family and the significant other came to the firehouse for drill and you got credit for that drill. And we did something that was topic related. The, actually, the first one we did was the 16 life safety initiatives. Just kind of a, like, hey, here's our Bible to try to keep people safe. Here's what we do that I bet none of you know about because your spouse didn't come home and tell you about the services we provide to you as a family. And then we had a social hour off the firehouse where they had pizza and got to sit around and just talk about what's it like to be the significant other of a firefighter. Now I set that for a two hour window. I, okay. That'll be two hours. We'll, we'll be good. We didn't get through two hours of them going around the room, just saying, what's it like to be married to a firefighter? It was, it just ran to the point they went, well, 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 you, I'm going to get in trouble with the other person who's at home because you're not coming home. So you need to take this next door and, to my knowledge, they've continued to do that other than COVID every year. And it so it team builds the family, but it also shows them you're not just talking a good game. I'm going to spend the money on getting you some pizzas. I'm going to spend the time to come bring you in and bring you together to get to know each other. So they have a bond when their significant other is struggling and they don't know who to talk to. Does that look normal or not? And I think organizations need to invest on the front end about that's what I'm going to do as the leader here. I am actually going to care about the people who are here. And here's exactly how I'm going to do it. Is it a perfect system? Absolutely not. Is it better than just going, yeah, we have a program and then we're going to move on. And, and if you run into something, you can call this 1-800 number. Uh, they, they see right through that. Yeah. No, we had started something similar in my last organization and we included the families and this and, and we took this from the police department. We co-opt and because they were already doing it. And uh, we we wouldn't know what they went in for, uh, you know, treatment and all that. But we got st statistics of, you know, employees, family members, you know. And what was really interesting is more family members took advantage of the services than than our own personnel. I believe that because we we it's we were brought up that I remember being told when I started my first day, kid, you leave your stuff at the door. Leave your stuff there, do your job, pick it up on the way out. And that it wasn't possible back then. It's not possible now. And so realizing that you're dealing with the whole human being and the person who usually sees that the employee is struggling first is their family. They just don't know what it is. So or, or you must be angry at me. They immediately assume that. And so they need to be able to go to an objective third party and go, what is that? Well, it's a lack of communication. It's a bad call. It's a, here's what you can do to kind of encourage that to not happen again. And so they don't feel alone. And, and the other thing I would just real quickly for employers, if you have an employee assistance program, that's great. Just make sure that you vet that employee assistance program and go, do you really know what my people do? Very specific to first responders. A lot of employee assistant programs have no idea what we do. So when somebody has the courage to reach out for help, they're lost. Not their fault. 
They weren't trained in the culture. You can do that. There are programs that are provided that you can teach counselors about that. It's no different, though, on running an organization. I wouldn't know what the challenges are when you've got a big assembly line plant that you're using and the chance for injuries and machine horrible things. I'm using machinery in it. Make sure they know so that when somebody calls and says, my husband was in this horrific accident and now no longer has a right hand, that they're not faint. Because that's a lot of the horror stories I hear about EAPs. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, again, I, I think as, as organizations want to invest in employee mental health, a big piece of that is the family. And so it's got to be yeah. a holistic approach. So Correct. So uh, let's just finish up today on maybe some takeaways uh, that you'd like to leave today uh, about mental health uh, from, from a personal perspective that you can share, but also from a, a leadership perspective um, so that uh, people that are moving forward, maybe they're struggling with an issue themselves, or maybe, a, you know, a, somebody running an organization is uh, trying to figure out, you know, what's the best strategy for them. What would, what would you share with them? Well, I think, I think some of the things, a lot of the things, frankly, that, that go across the, the mental health platform, can be used on any platform. So I'll do a little bit more generalization in case there's somebody sitting here now going, well, that's, that's a tough story, but luckily I haven't had to deal with that. So we'll take it from a, a higher level at the leadership. First of all, don't be a perfectionist. It's great to strive to be one. And we always talk about set the bar as high as you can. And I, I've always been a believer in that. But I, I myself put myself, because of wearing the cape, into a vicious spin because if you are a perfectionist, eventually you're gonna cycle through depression because you, as you try to make decisions, you're gonna make mistakes. Your initial reaction when you make a mistake was I didn't try hard enough, I didn't put in enough time, I didn't work hard enough, and so you try even harder. When it doesn't work again, if you don't realize that it's not going to work and you push to the next level, you'll start down that depression cycle. And once you start down that cycle, if you're not, cognizant of, I need help to get out of this, you can work your way right out of your job and you can work your way right to that brink and all the way to suicide. So realize you're not perfect. Realize your cape doesn't work all the time. So one of the best pieces of advice I got when I became a fire chief was make sure that you make friends with somebody like yourself that you can talk to about in your industry what are some of the struggles that you have? Because one of the things that I see people not wanting to move up into leadership positions is because they feel a disconnect. I'm, I'm going to lose my friends. Things aren't going to be the way they used to be. That's true. And anybody who tells you it's not is, is painting a rosy picture that's, that's not real. So you need to make new friends. You need to make friends outside of your industry who just know you. It's Randy and Pat. It's not Chief Brugman. It's not Chief Kenny. So that because that doesn't define who you are. And so you can talk to them about life in general. You also, I think, need to make sure that when you broaden that spectrum, that you talk to people who are leaders in your industry, because it's very lonely at the top of any industry. And so being able to talk to a fellow leader and going, you're not going to believe what happened to me this week. And I have no clue how to make this better to have somebody go four years ago been there, done that. Here's what you don't want to do. And here's what you can do. So so make that, I always say it's your lifeboat. Put as many people in your lifeboat as you can, because you never know when you're going to need to use them. You have to role model it then. So sometimes you have to take the cape off and hand it to somebody else and go, you lead. I'm going to stand back here. So empower your people. Too many organizations are afraid of, well, that young lady is a hell of a lot smarter than I am. So I really don't want her to know all I know, because once that happens, eh, they're probably not going to need me anymore. Nothing could be further from the truth. You're going to build that person's, their own integrity, their self-esteem, the ability to lead that thing, succession planning that every organization struggles with. You're going to help that happen. And you're also going to get to take a little bit of a break where you're like, okay, I, I don't know everything. I can't know everything. I can't do everything. Isn't it great the organization is going forward because I've got more and more people who can do the job and do it well, and they feel really good about what they do. And when they do that, as a leader, then you have to recognize it. You have to make sure people know, not my idea. And I'll give you a perfect example. It's kind of silly, but it's true. My consultant, when I was writing the book, after the end of each chapter, there's lessons learned. 
we fought about that. I go, I don't want to do that. That, that sounds like a manual to me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, no, I want you to do that because somebody's going to read the book. They won't be able to relate to it. They'll put it on a shelf. Five years later, their neighbor will lose their spouse. They'll go, what did that guy say? They don't have time to read 300 pages. They go to the table of contents. They find that chapter and they just read the four bullet points before they go to the wake. Every time I go to speak, somebody will say to me every single time, you know what my favorite part of the book is? And I wince and they go, it's the lessons learned. So I always have to call Shannon and go, yeah, okay, you were right again. So make sure when they do something well, you go, this was not my idea. In fact, maybe I wasn't even in, in favor of it. But boy, isn't it fantastic? And it was Samantha's idea. So you you embody that feeling and then people buy more into the team. People need more recognition today than they ever have. And that, that for some reason upsets people. You know, uh, well, we didn't need to be patted on the back. We sure the hell did. We just didn't ask for it. Now they're asking for it. So just give it to them. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt you to do that. And then I think the, the final thing, and, and it's something that we we learned, I think, through COVID is, is that it's self-care. You need to know when to step back and go, I need to refuel. I need a break for me. And don't feel like that by doing that, you're showing a weakness in your organization because you can only do so much. And if you push it far enough, eventually you won't be capable of leading anybody. Yep. Oh, good advice. Good, great advice. So, well, Pat, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show and, and sharing the journey. And, uh, you know, I know because uh, I've watched you speak several times. And as I alluded to, I've read the book a couple of times, probably will read it again. But you're uh, you're making a difference in the lives of other people as you go out and uh, share share your journeys message. And, and uh, thanks for doing that, because I know sometimes it hasn't been easy. Uh, but I also know that, uh, you're, you're really making a difference and, uh, sure appreciate what you're doing and appreciate your friendship. Well, I, I, I'm, it's always an honor to be with you and I have so much respect for you. And so it's a thrill to be on here. You, you certainly showed what it was right to be a true leader. And I'll finish with people will always say to me when I'm out, get off the stage, they'll be like, I, I don't know how you do that. And so I'll, I'll let everybody watching in on a little secret. If you look really closely when I'm up there, I'm, I'm not alone. So my dad is behind me. My son is behind me. My wife is behind me. And there are thousands of firefighters who over the decades, this isn't just a new problem, got to a point where they died by suicide. And they're all up there going, yeah, they need to know the truth because that's really what happens. And we don't want anybody else to have to end up up on this stage with you. And that power I get when I speak, um, I, I can't really describe it, but it, 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 it makes me smile because I can feel them standing there. And it's uh, so there's a selfish part of that, too, that, that really is good. And I'm, I, I'll keep doing it until it, it's not needed anymore. And I hope someday that's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, I hope so, too. Well, thank you. Thanks again, Randy. Yeah, hey, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Leadership Crucible podcast. If you have a story of adversity you'd like to share, we'd love to hear it. Visit us at theleadershipcruciblepodcast.com and join us next time as we continue to explore how to live lives of success and significance.